uh, the participation has stabilized, so maybe we can uh, proceed with the with the uh, with well with the mini course. We're very very happy to have Lev tell us about uh, tell us about you know I don't know one or maybe two categorical level. How, what is life? Maybe I don't know one or two categorical level above what uh, we normally do in the seminar. But that's that's great, and I uh, I see Alexei also listening to being in on this talk so it's anyway it's very exciting to have you guys here and then tell us about your work and uh with this i'll uh, i get i you know I'll, i i uh i i give the control to left so okay thank you very much for inviting me thank you andre uh, so this is our joint work with alexia blomkov and it's based on uh, previous work with Anton Kapustin and Natalia Soulina, and uh, so you, you will see. So let me begin with a very long introduction, and if, if you don't like it, then uh, tell me to go uh, directly, more directly to main material. So first, uh, the title mentioned two categories associated to quiver varieties. So let, let's first look at what is a two category. And to be honest, I don't know a precise definition, but I can give you an idea. So it's a category in which homes between two objects form a category, uh, as it says in, uh, in number one. Uh, and, a and then a composition of morphisms from A to B and from B to C into A to C should be a functor from product of two categories into a third category. So in particular, a category of, so in particular, endomorphisms of an object should form a monoidal category because you can compose a, one home from A to itself with another one. So this gives you uh, a composition of objects inside the category and A. So here are two simplest examples of uh, two categories. Uh, so for a commute, so first of all, consider a commutative algebra and uh, consider to, to it, we can associate a two category with a single object. So the only thing we can see there is endomorphisms of this object, which should form a monoidal category. And that category will be derived category of A, mod of A modules. And the monoidal structure will come from derived tensor product. So you have a, so to say it simply, if, if you just have an algebra, then an, to an algebra corresponds a category with a single object whose endomorphisms is this algebra. That's all story. Now we go one floor up to commutative algebra. We associate a two category where there is a single object and its endomorphisms are modules over this algebra and you can tensor multiply them. So that's example number one. As you see, monoidal structure there is very commutative. Example number two, consider a two category where an object is an algebra. To make it simple, let's assume it's a commutative algebra. And morphisms from algebra A to algebra B will be a derived category of bimodules. So modules, which are modules over the tensor product of these algebras. So then you can compose a module from algebra A to algebra B with module from algebra B to algebra C by tensoring them over the intermediate algebra B. Again, you, you may add words derived. If B is commuted, if, if B is not commutative, then you have to use opposite of B on the left. But with commutative, there is no problem. So these are two basic examples of uh, two categories which are known to everybody, more or less. Uh, so our constructions are based on the fact, let's put it word fact in quotes, that one can associate a two category to any symplectic variety. So 
And this should be as natural as associating a category of coherent sheaves, derived category of coherent sheaves over a variety, not necessarily simplicity. Um, this comes from our old paper with uh, Anton Kapustin and Natalia Soulina, and which is a physics paper, mostly. Uh, so it's an extension, it, it's an old idea which is raised one floor up. So very old idea is that if X is a Kähler manifold, then physicists associate to it a two-dimensional n equal to two supersymmetric sigma model, whatever this means. This means that they study math from two-dimensional surfaces in real sense into X and take a sum over these maps somehow. Then this model can be modified through what's called a topological B-twist. Again, uh, it's just, may, maybe you heard these words uh, before. Uh, so the result will be another quantum field theory, which is topological. It's known as topological B model. It's an essential part of the mirror symmetry story. And topological, two-dimensional topological quantum field theories have a category associated to them. It's a category of their boundary conditions. If you have a topological two-dimensional theory, a quantum field theory, there will be a category with it. It comes with a category. And this is the category of coherent sheaves. So if you, if you were to ask a physicist what is a category of coherent sheaves and why do you have to use resolutions, a physicist will tell you it's because of B models and the fact that you have to use resolutions to define morphisms comes from a certain field within this B model which, uh, which is responsible for extensions. So, Lev, if I, I maybe it's too early to ask this question, but is, is the statement supposed to be obvious, supposed to be a guess, supposed to be a computation? Uh, this is a computation which is done uh, in uh, quantum field theory, where you study uh, the boundary conditions and uh, morphisms between them. So, since I, I, I just wanted to throw this I have to substantiate a certain claim that two categories associated to symplectic variety. Um, this, the, I do not have a precise definition of this two category. And this is sort of under construction. So I want to give you an argument why you should believe in it. So what I already said, you can trust it because it's used by a huge number of people starting from uh, the homological mirror symmetry story. If, if you don't like it, then please tell me if... Uh... No, I, I mean, I, I, I was just like, precisely with the, with the new definition in mind, I wanted to understand what was the, what was the exact status of the previous, of the previous statement. The previous, uh, so for, for physicists... I understand, I understand there are some examples where, where uh, this looks like a believable statement, but is there some... Um, in, anyway, please continue. Don't, you know, I, I understand where you want to talk, talk about something. Uh, it, actually, it helps me if you interrupt and uh, comment. So uh, it helps. So if X now is hyperkähler, then to this you associate a three dimensional N equal to um, four supersymmetric sigma model. And uh, which admits, which also admits a topological B twist. And the result is a three dimensional uh, topological quantum field theory known as 3D B model. And that one has a two category of boundary conditions. So to a three dimensional theory, you associate a two category. For, from the quantum field theory point of view, this is absolutely natural. So even if some things that I say will turn out to be wrong, about this two category and would, would need mathematical corrections and physical corrections, the underlying statement would still be true. So in particular, this means that two categories are associated to Nakajima quiver varieties. 
So what is this two category, very roughly? The simplest objects would be Lagrangian subvarieties, as you may expect, meaning holomorphic Lagrangian subvarieties, and very naive. And, and, and smooth ones, or, or? No, no, not necessarily smooth. That's good. Okay. This is, so this is the realm of algebraic geometry, so things are not smooth, and you cannot smooth them by perturbing. So you have to resolve somehow instead of uh, smoothing. So the simplest objects would be Lagrangian uh, subvarieties. And you would naively guess that home between two subvarieties would be coherent sheaves over their intersection. So this would be a guess. You mean modules over like their direct intersection? Is that the, uh, or in some let, sense? Let me, let me not be specific. I will give you a more exact answer for this and um, and it will, it will, yes, you, somehow you have to derive or do something with the intersection, especially if the intersection is bad. And I will tell you what to do. And it will not be what you might have guessed from algebraic geometry. Uh, so it, again, in, in the naive defi definition, a composition would be, again, what you would guess. You take a triple intersection, you pull back sheaves from double intersections, take their tensor product, and push them forward to the intersection between first and third. So again, this is very naive. Uh, more generally, uh, more general objects, again, in a naive description, would look like vibration with Lagrangian base. So you would have an extra variety Y and a map from F to your symplectic variety, so that the image of that map is uh, Lagrangian. So here is a picture. This red thing grows away from the, from the variety. So the vibration is not part of the variety. The fibers are, live elsewhere. So what is wrong with this naive description? When Lagrangian subvarieties and their intersection are smooth, and locally the intersection looks like intersection between tangent spaces. In other words, locally, either they cross each other transversely or they coincide. So they behave same way as their tangent spaces. Then home between Lagrangian subvarieties is almost very close to coherent sheaves over the intersection as one might have guessed. And in particular, endomorphisms of Lagrangian subvariety would be almost coherent sheaves over that subvariety with monoidal structure being tensor product. Again, almost has, let, let me under, so one has to be careful here. Uh, and, and, I already said that in contrast to Foucault and Fleur, you cannot perturb L1 and L2 if they have a bad intersection to make their intersection good and apply a previous uh, intuition. So here is an example of a bad intersection. Take your symplectic variety as a cotangent bundle to C with coordinates X and Y and uh, consider two Lagrangian subvarieties, one being y equals to zero, and the other being y equals to x to the n. So this intersection is bad because they touch each other at the intersection point, and yet they, so their tangent spaces coincide there, yet they go apart, they, they do not coincide. So a naive guess, so, so, so the intersection looks, uh, like a fat point. I think that's the name in algebraic geometry. And naively, you would guess that you have to take modules over C of X mod X to the N. Just intersect them as you would intersect the structure sheaves of these two subvarieties. And this guess is wrong, surprisingly. And the correct answer is you have to take, first of all, C of X mod X to the N plus one, not X to the N. It's not a typo. So let me mark it here. You see X to the N plus one. 
And moreover, you do not take the whole category of uh, modules over this quotient, but only a singular part of this category. That's, be, that's because uh, this is like the differential of a function x of uh, it's x n plus one. It's a, it's a, this is like the graph of the gradient of that function. You're one. Yeah, you're exactly. Granted. Exactly. Uh, uh, x to the n plus one appears. Oops, sorry x to the n plus one appears because the derivative of x to the n plus one, well, over n plus one, of course, is equal to n plus one, that's irrelevant right now, times x to the n. So you have to take antiderivative. That's, that's the point. Um, so x to the n, I, I will say it in a little bit later, x to the n plus one is a generating function for y equals x to the n as a Lagrangian subvariety. So you have to use the... <laughs> While we on n plus one being uh, irrelevant, do you envision your two category making sense over arbitrary field or it has to be over complex numbers? You have algebraic Lagrangian things. Mm, I don't... Uh, it, it's possible that it makes sense over other fields. So the definitions will be um, algebraic. In, in what follows. So possibly it makes sense over other fields. But again, the essence of the story is that you have to use to describe Lagrangians for their generating functions. Well, let me um, go, go um, let me make more precise statements. So when your symplectic variety is a cotangent bundle, the simplest objects would be just functions over your base variety x. And the corresponding Lagrangian would be a graph of the differential of w. So w is, uh, in, um, some of us were subjected to a course in classical mechanics for applications where uh, students are taught a method of uh, generating functions, uh, where you describe Lagrangian submanifolds as graphs of differential of a function of coordinates on them. So this is what happens here. So your function w in, in this example was x to the n plus one over n plus one. And then you would get sub variety y equals x to the n uh, as a graph of the differential. And then the home between these two objects, the functions, will be the category of matrix factorizations over X of the difference between the, the generating functions W. So this is the reason why we have to deal with the category of matrix factorizations, which I will explain later. So we need matrix factorizations because they describe categories of morphisms between Lagrangian subvarieties. So here is the above example in detail. So you have to use W1 equal to zero, which gives you Y equals to zero, the first Lagrangian, and W2, which is properly normalized X to the N plus one, which gives you the second one. And the home between them would be category of matrix factorizations of x to the n plus one over n plus one. And I will explain what this category is uh, in detail uh, later. Uh, so the same story can be told in the language of derived algebraic geometry. Again, here I'll be very brief and I will say a few more words uh, later. So the, what I know about derived algebraic geometry was told me by Anton Kapustin who learned it from Dmitry Orlov. So if, if you don't like what I say, then uh, you can uh, ask uh, maybe them. So this two category that we associate to cotangent bundle also shows up in derived algebraic geometry in the following way. So they consider coherent sheaves over X, over our base. And this is a monoidal category. You can 
take tensor products of sheaves. And then you may consider what would be a two category of module categories over this monoidal category. So you're categorifying the idea of representations of an algebra. So you have an algebra and you have category of module. Now you have a, a category with monoidal structure, which categorifies an algebra. So the question is, what would categorify the category of modules? That's what they address. And their answer should be more or less the same as what we do here for symplectic geometry. So roughly speaking, uh, they would have, they have odd tangent bundle instead of even cotangent bundle. And the vectors in the odd tangent bundle are the ones used for um, Kazool complexes, which resolve sub varieties. So in this category of represent, in this two category of representations, the simplest sort of objects will be sub varieties of X. Uh, and you would have to use their resolutions and uh, they will come from this, roughly speaking, from this odd tangent bundle. And you can read the works of Ben Svi and Nadler as just representatives of this school. But in this approach, you will not see directly the symplectic structure of X. So you will not, so they, they have their two category, but they don't see that there is symplectic geometry behind it. So in particular, in, uh, in symplectic case, you have so-called Legendre transform, which is a Fourier, or a Legendre Fourier transform, which switches coordinates and momenta. And in their description, it would become some causal duality. So it won't be as geometric. So what is the advantage of uh, playing with cotangent bundle besides uh, geometry and uh, connection with uh, symplectic geometry? Suppose that we do not take the whole cotangent bundle, but only an open subvariety in it. Why would we want to do it? For example, we want to impose stability condition. We want to take a Hamiltonian reduction by action of uh, group G. So as, uh, as you know, in case of quivers, you, in order to get a nice quotient, you impose stability condition, which cuts something closed from T star X. Uh, so with, with our approach, we can define the two category also for this uh, open subvariety which is now it's not a contingent bundle. And moreover, it will come with a two functor from the original one into this uh, sub variety two category. So we can deal with stability condition. This, this is our important technical advantage over the uh, derived algebraic geometry story. So in particular, we can define G equivariant two category of this, which corresponds to Hamiltonian reduction, and that would be Nakajima variety. Uh, so in our work with Alexei, we take uh, varieties, uh, affine varieties, which correspond to N U R instantons on C2. So you take a contingent bundle to GLN times uh, framing morphisms from CR to CN takes stable sub variety and uh, double quotient. Lev, I'm a little bit confused about the order of the tangent bundles because. Uh... Uh, sorry, I lost your sound. I'm confused about the order of the tangent bundle. If you, if you take the tangent bundle to the pre-quotient, don't you have to impose the moment map equation too? Or, yeah. else, uh, uh, or yeah. else you have to take the tangent bundle to the stack, but then it's somehow, I mean, but you first take the tangent bundle, then the quotient. Uh, so there's also moment map equation somewhere, right? Yes. Um, so the answer, okay, I'll, I will go into the details of this a little bit later. Um, so, in order to describe equivariant, uh, in, 
in the language of uh, generating functions, uh, you do not have to impose the moment map explicitly, the moment map condition explicitly. So it will not enter into the homes. I will explain it. You don't have to impose it. When, when you define homes as uh, categories between Lagrange and sub varieties, you do not have to, um, you do not have to impose uh, the condition that moment map is equal to zero. Somehow it will happen automatically. Okay, thank you. But moment map will reemerge a little bit later in a funny way. Uh, so we consider these affine, uh, affine quivers of the simplest type. So as uh, you know, um, when R is equal to zero, we get so-called commuting variety, which is a, which is not even a, properly treated, not even a variety. So as a variety, it's something uh, singular. It's and the way you define it, it's not commuting either because commuting is the moment map. Yes, exactly, exactly. So the, so the quotient itself, sorry, so uh, coming back to your question, we will describe the two category as equivalent to category rather than to category associated to the quotient. And that's why, as you will see, we will not have to impose the condition of moment being equal to zero explicitly. So we'll be describing equivariant to category instead of taking the quotient and then working with the quotient. So in case of commuting variety, as you will see, to category actually is simple. So to category does not feel the singularity. The singularity will appear when you want to study Drinfeld center of this two category, the, the center, which will be roughly, which is roughly sheaves over the corresponding symplectic quotient. And there you have to be careful in how you define the center. But when you describe objects and morphisms between objects, this is the simplest of all of them. Uh, the next one, when R is equal to one is Hilbert scheme of points on C2. And that's uh, the one associated with uh, links in S3. And uh, the other ones are instant points. So in these two categories, we have two families of, well, let's say just two main objects. One object, let me call it FL, and it is related to contingent bundle to flag variety. And the other object of the two category is equivariant slot of a slice, so I'll call it PS. So it will happen that when R is equal to zero, that's the case of commuting variety, the end of, so, sorry, so these objects emerge, appear for every value of R, commuting variety, Hilbert scheme, or instant points. So for commuting variety, that's, as I said, is the simplest case, the endomorphisms of FL will be equivariant coherent sheaves over derived Steinberg variety. That's a long name. And also equivalently equivariant coherent sheaves over Grothendieck Steinberg variety. Uh, and it didn't fit, oh, 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 just a moment. It didn't fit into my page. Ah, here it says. Groth and Dick Steinberg. So they will emerge in this way. And the home between FL and ES will be coherent sheaves on good AN quiver varieties, such as non equivariant contingent bundle to flags. And this way, and this is one of the ways where we can get closer to what you do, Andre. So your varieties appear at least the, the varieties themselves appear in this way. So for general R, we construct a homomorphism from a fine gray group on N strands into the monoidal category of endomorphisms of our flag related object. So we have a two category. There we have an object FL. It's endomorphisms form monoidal category just from basic setup. 
And that's where we send a fine braids on end screens. Say left, you're going to define those Lagrangians later or... or yes, uh... yes, yes. Okay. So okay. Why, why am I going so quickly over this story? I want to persuade you and the other listeners why uh, you should listen to the story about matrix factorizations and uh, weird two categories. Cool, thank you. So, because you, so, sometimes it happens that people, if, if I start with matrix factorizations, uh, uh, people will turn off because it's a weird category. But it describes morphisms between Lagrangians. Uh, so some of your uh, stable envelopes will appear here as, uh, as Lagrangian subvarieties for fibrate. So the, the base of this object FL will be your, sta will be your stable uh, envelope uh, for the corresponding instant on or Hilbert scheme space. So you're looking at, uh, at your sub-variety appearing in, uh, in this context. So when R is equal to one, when you have a Hilbert scheme, then this homomorphism from a fine braids into a monoidal category will factor for ordinary braids. So here I should, should have put some question marks. It's a bold statement, which I think we have not quite proved completely but should be true. So when R is equal to zero and we're dealing with commutative variety, we get categorification of a fine Heke. And this is similar to what uh, Bezro Kavnikov and Drish did for coherent sheaves over uh, Steinberg and Grothendieck Steinberg. So as, as you see, R equal to zero theory is Commuting variety is equivariant contingent bundle. So this is also covered by derived algebraic geometry and is known to experts in the field. When R is equal to one, we get a uh, categorification of ordinary Hecke. And for positive R, we get, again, this is a little bit bold. So it, it factors through rather. We, we get a categorification of cyclotomic Hecke algebra. As if it is expected that cyclotomic Hecke algebra is related to instantons. And uh, so here we um, construct this categorification. Okay, look, uh, just ignore the previous, just ignore this top. So for R equal to one, uh, let's, let's look at this one. Let's look at this one. For R equal to one, uh, consider take a braid. S hat means I sent it into the category of endomorphisms of the object FL. So consider it's Holmes with, with identity braid. So we prove that the result will be the invariant of a link that you get by closing your braid. So if you close all the strands of, of braid beta, you get a link in S3. And so what you get by taking homes with identity will be link homology. And we are in the process, uh, Alexei and I are in the process of proving that this is the same as uh, the homology uh, that you derive from Zergel bimodules that they're isomorphic. Now in, in two categories, you expect, at least you should expect an analog of Riemann rock, Ruffendieck uh, and so on, uh, formula. So namely, just on general grounds, and we derive specific expression in our paper with uh, Alexei, there is a functor from endomorphisms of this object FL, that's where we send the braids, into the center of the two category. So in ordinary category, you, you take an object, usually you send an object to its churn character, which is an element in Hochschild homology. More generally, you could take endomorphisms 
endomorphism of an object and uh, send it similarly to Hochschild homology. So here we do it one floor above. We take an object in uh, the category of endomorphisms and send it to Drinfeld Center, which is roughly speaking coherent sheaves on Hilbert scheme. So just the fact that we send braids to endomorphisms of an object tells us that to a braid we can associate a sheaf over Hilbert scheme. At least it should be, it, it, it comes naturally. And then this Riemann Roth would say that if you take homology of that sheaf over Hilbert scheme, it will be the same as home between your braid and identity braid. So Euler characteristic of uh, homology of a sheaf is the same as integral of its churn character, roughly. One floor above, that's what this says. So now let me uh, say a little bit, I, I'm, all, I'm almost at the end of, uh, of, of the long introduction. It's just an advertising of... Uh... So now you may ask, why does it happen that AN type quivers generate objects in the two category of an affine quiver? Um, the, the object FL is related to to AN type quiver, contingent bundle to flag variety. So how, how can we have two quivers together? One is the affine quiver, which provides uh, two category, and the other is, say, linear AN type quiver, which generates an object in the two category. So let me give you a hint. So this is, again, a story which has to be told in more details and with uh, some physics. Um, so here is what happens. Uh, so roughly from, from symplectic standpoint, um, Nakajima Cherkis varieties are, is a result of a Hamiltonian reduction. So an edge of a quiver is a symplectic variety with Hamiltonian action of two GLNs. In case of Nakajima, Nakajima, so, and then there are two types of edges. The Nakajima edge, which is T star home, which you know very well. And then there is another edge, which comes from Cherkis. Uh, and let me say something else, and I could be more specific and tell you what this variety is. Uh, it's just, so if you want so-called bow quiver varieties, all you have to do is introduce a new type of edge which is another uh, symplectic equivariant symplectic variety. So now this symplectic variety becomes a functor, in fact, a pair of functors between two categories associated to fine quivers. So this N1 and N2 turn out to be numbers at the circle. And let me ignore framing. So I will not say much about framing right now. You may put both R is equal to zero or equal to one. So the edge of a Nakajima quiver is also a functor between two categories of affine quivers. How does it happen? I'll, again, here I'll just give you a rough idea. Very, uh, just to, to entice. Uh, let us set the condition mu equal to zero, the moment equal to zero, in a derived way, which means that you have to write a Kazool complex which kills all the components of matrix, all the entries of matrix mu. So what is a Kazool complex? You have to take a sum of exterior powers of uh, GLN, GLN star, and put there a differential, which is wedging with the moment. A moment is, so a moment is a vector in a vector space GLN star. You take the sum of its exterior powers and the differential is wedging with mu. That's the Kuzul complex. So to say differently, you consider uh, 
now shifts over your original variety, which is product of T star forms. That's what you get from edges. But now at each circle, you have to add odd coordinates. Um, GLN shifted by negative one. So the ring of GLN minus one will be exactly the sum of exterior powers of GLN star. And you have to add a differential, which is a trace, uh, I'm cheating a little bit here, of theta times mu, where theta is an odd GLN matrix. Odd meaning its entries are odd variables. That's what you have to do. So you get a DG scheme instead of, uh, in, uh, so, so you get a DG scheme and then you take the quotient by the action of the group. So that would be derived the way of imposing a condition that moments are equal to zero, which is useful by the way, if you want to work with uh, singular, um, singular quiver varieties such as Steinberg variety. Uh, but now you can use Kazul duality to trade this odd matrix theta for an even matrix, which is shifted by two. So Kazul duality says that coherent sheaves over this DG scheme is the same derived category, is the same as coherent sheaves over something else where you replace uh, GLN by uh, sorry, odd matrix theta by even matrix X. And this matrix X will be one of the arrows in the affine quiver. So here, so I'm just showing you a little bit what happens under the hood. One of the arrow, arrows in the affine quiver is Kazul dual to the variables you would use to kill moment in the quiver which builds the object. And the differential that you saw before will be treated by a potential. That's the rule. Again, I'll explain it a little bit later. A differential becomes potential under, uh, under Kazul duality. And, uh, and so if you pursue this program, then you will see that linear uh, A and type quivers will give you objects in, uh, in, the, cat in the two category of uh, affine quivers. Okay, so this, so this is the end of introduction. I think I, I should now move more specifically. So if you have questions, I'll go to another page. So maybe I should add that physically speaking, why do you get two quivers? We get, um, two sets of, uh, let's say, NS5 and uh, D4 brains. And those brains are perpendicular to each other. So one set gives us a fine quiver and the other set gives a AN type quiver and then they intersect with each other and uh, that's the structure that we get out of it. So it's a story about two stacks of brains which intersect each other. Yeah, but I have a question. Can I have a question? <laughs> Do you want me to go back to introduction? No, no, I just, it, it just, uh, I know it was in the previous page. Uh, so what you explained is it works really well for the cotangent bundles over the algebraic variety. Yes. Is there any version of like, you know, guesses? I, I guess it's a question for everybody. Like when you uh, replace cotangent bundle by some kind of like compact variety, like, you know, Suppose you have a more complexity variety is K3. So did anybody guess what would be the Kapustin, Saulin, Rosansky theory in this case? I just see. Okay, I, so let me, since, since, since you, since you mentioned this, so let me tell you that the, our story is pretty old and it was not somehow wasn't picked up by mathematicians, maybe because there was no obvious application. Uh, you, you need a killer application. Um, so one way to do 
to do this story for a general manifold would be um, to split it into uh, neighborhoods, uh, do this category in each neighborhood, and then glue them together. So the fact that I uh, that the fact that we can define two categories of an open subvariety in T star C M, for example, tells tells us that we could that this program can be pursued. But but it is uh, fairly complicated. But then there is another story. So if 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 you want to listen for three minutes, I can tell you how this. Uh, what else could one do with this story? Um, so. You can deform uh, T star of X as a symplectic variety. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Uh, so in real symplectic geometry, there is a theory, theorem, Darbu theorem, that a neighborhood of Lagrangian submanifold is contingent bundle. To, uh, to that Lagrangian submanifold. In the algebraic geometry, this is not necessarily so. So a neighborhood of, uh, say, zero section of T star X, uh, sorry, a neighborhood of Lagrangian submanifold is not necessarily isomorphic as symplectic variety to contingent bundle to that Lagrangian submanifold. So therefore- Or what, even or even as an algebraic variety. Even, yes, you, you know that even as an algebraic variety, neighborhood is not the same as normal bundle. You, you could deform it. So one could ask what would happen if you deform T star X. Uh, the, the deformations uh, should be uh, first Dolbo cohomology. So I will just say, say, stay maybe a minute or a couple of minutes on this. First, the book homology of uh, um, mm, 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 or should I say? Maybe I'll say it a little. Bit. First, the book homology of the sum of um, of S. Um, star of x. So in other words, you consider polynomial functions on, tang on the tangent bundle and take first the law cohomology. So these would be, um, these would be um, uh, if, if not for H1, these would be small Hamiltonians by which you deform, deform, by which you move your symplectic variety. And the fact that you take H1 um, tells, you, tells you that you're deforming. So, uh, the first, so the first deformation might come from the place where the so-called second fundamental form of the manifold lives. So if you took, uh, if you took Romanian geometry at uh, Moscow State University, maybe you were taught what is uh, the second fundamental form of the manifold. So it shows up here as uh, the first deformation. So the result will be the following. Now, the, um, so for example, the endomorphisms of the zero section will still be sheets but the tensor product will be deformed and it will become non-commutative. So this, uh, the, um, this uh, second fundamental form may deform the, the tensor product of sheaves over X and make it non-commutative. So we're quantizing, essentially we're quantizing the category of coherent sheaves in the sense that tensor product becomes non-commutative. It is one floor above what uh, Kontsevich did to, uh, uh, to formal quantization of uh, Poisson manifolds. So here you're deforming coherent sheaves. And then, so in, uh, we have a second paper with uh, Kapustin in which this, uh, this is studied as, as much as we could. What will be the result of this deformation? Uh, in particular, um, 
In particular, it's known that the category of uh, coherent sheaves over symplectic variety itself is, uh, of course, it's monoidal, but its ten but its tensor product may have a non-trivial associator uh, related to a tier class. And the fact that associator ap appears as a deformation of naive tensor product in uh, coherent sheaves over symplectic variety is related to the fact that the neighborhood of diagonal in inside SM squared is not exactly a cotangent bundle to diagonal. And it is a tier class is the deformation. It is the, a tier class is the element in uh, H1 of uh, S3 of the tangent bundle. So it does not deform the commutativity, but it affects the associativity. And all this is discussed in our paper with, uh, in our paper uh, with Kapustin. So there is a story, at least what may happen when you deform cotangent bundle. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I guess uh, you told me that already like five times, but I'm here. I always hate to issue this. You know? <laughs> I always that every... Sorry, yeah. I'm happy to say you know, no, no, but it's, it's you know, it's it's always I, repetition is mother of learning. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so so now let me uh, just give a, a an exposition of uh, matrix factorizations. So this category would be a category of uh, morphisms between zero section of T star X and the graph of DW. So let X be a fine variety. Uh, now I say fine variety with certain trepidation. So for, for me here, a fine variety will be uh, CN or maybe CN minus something closed. And uh, yeah, more or less. So if you don't like something that I say, then I'll say, how about, how about these two cases? Our toy example will be C with coordinate X and W being X to the N. Um, so let me, um, before we go into matrix factorizations, let me tell you that, um, so as, as people know there are two ways to explain what is a category derived category of coherent sheaves on on a variety or what is derived category of modules uh, you may start with a category of sheaves or category of modules and then explain what it means to derive so you get uh, new morphisms and so on or if you want a pedestrian description you simply say use a homotopy category of free modules. That would be, these two are supposed to be equivalent mostly. So you go from objects to their resolutions. But of course, if you simply talk about free modules, it wouldn't look as natural as, uh, as the original story about uh, deriving uh, a category of modules. So matrix factorizations also have two sides, similarly, because matrix factorizations are a closed cousin, closed relative, actually, actually it's a deformation of the category of coherent sheaves. I'll explain in what sense later. So there is a side in which you explain it conceptually as a category of singularity. And there is a side where you introduced matrix factorization. The word matrix factorization is a generalization of a complex of free CX modules. So when you hear matrix factorization, it's because it's a homotopy category side of the story developed by Eisenberg, who invented them as far as I understand. So let me say a few words about the derived side. 
so the idea is to take the category of modules over CX mod W, but not the whole category. You want to take a quotient by perfect subcategory. And perfect uh, and objects are called perfect if they have finite length resolution. So you declare those objects zero. How do you take a quotient? You declare them zero. And you also say that if a morphism can be factored through a perfect object, then such morphism is declared zero as well. So it's, it's not as simple as one might hope. So in our toy example, let's call the algebra itself A. So A as a module over itself is perfect. So it is declared to be zero object. And the singular object would be quotient of A by X to the K, where K is less than N. Because this module, would have an infinite resolution. Here, here I wrote, wrote it. Very simple, infinite, semi-infinite resolution. Note that the resolution is too periodic. And this is a general fact established by Eisenberg, apparently, that resolutions of uh, singular objects at starting, starting at some point will become too periodic. And since any finite resolution is considered zero, you can simply cut it, cut it off if, if you want to take the quotient by perfect objects. So two features of this uh, quotient category. First feature, consider an exact sequence where you have the quotient module. It goes into the free module of rank one and then goes to another object, quotient by x to the n minus k. So here we have two singular objects, this one and that one. But in between, you have a zero object. And the whole thing is exact. So by general rule, this if you want to declare A to be zero object, you have to say that a homological shift of one of the modules is the other one. So this is a surprising feature that a shifted module, you would, exp well, shifted in, in ordinary uh, derived category, shifted module is a shifted module. But here it's a similar module, as good as the original one. Only the power of x is different. It's the comp complementary power of x. And as you see, a shift by 2 is identity, because you go back from k to n minus k, and then to n minus n minus k, you're back at k. So it's funny uh, that homological shift works in this funny way. And the second is uh, consider a morphism, homomorphism from module to zero object multiplied by n minus k. That's a legal that's a, a valid homomorphism because x to the k will go to x to the n. So ideal will go to ideal. And then send a by, send the generator to generator, a to a over x to the l, another quotient module. So compose these two homomorphisms and you get a homomorphism from one quotient module to another multiplication by x to the n minus k, but it factors through zero object. So this one must be uh, declared as zero, even if n minus k is less than l. So if n minus k is small and l is large, this would give you a non-trivial homomorphism between modules. And yet this homomorphism must be declared zero because it factors. So this is as much as I wanted to say about uh, the conceptual side of matrix factorizations. This theorem of Eisenberg about two periodicity, in what generality does it hold? To be honest, I do not know. I never read, to be honest, uh, what I do is a very simple um, computational work on the matrix factorization side. 
So unfortunately, I do not know. Uh, so I, I, I heard. I it, yes. Uh, this, it worked uh, for, uh, originally he started just uh, uh, to hear and choose from the hypersurface and you studied what's called maximal coin macaulay model and for them that is true so they seem to study maximal coin macaulay models on uh, on any hypersurface like it's in like because you know this equation of hypersurface w could be anything but you need to impose this maximal coin macaulay condition cool thanks uh, so now let's move to the homotopy side uh, and define homotopy category of matrix factorizations. So an object there is a pair where M is a free CX module, which is Z2 graded. So it's a sum of uh, uh, zero graded and uh, one graded uh, free modules. And D is an endomorphism of M as a module, uh, which has degree one, which is odd. So in other words, D, the differential, twisted, it's called twisted differential. In the lingo of matrix factorizations, this guy is called twisted differential. Uh, so it sends M1 to M0 and M0 back to M1, which means you have two matrices because these are free modules. So their homomorphisms are matrices. And the condition is that the square of D is equal to W times identity matrix. So if you go by, say, from M1 to M0 and back, it should be just multiplication by W in M1. And same way, if you go from M0 to M1 and then back to M0, it shouldn't be again a multiplication by W. Uh, hence uh, the name matrix factorization. D10 and D01 factorize W times identity matrix. So if W is non-zero, then the ranks of M0 and M1 should be the same. So example. Uh, Recall that here we want to, um, so here we consider X uh, to be C with coordinate X and W to be X to the M. So here is a matrix factorization. You take, uh, so first of all, strangely here, you work with three modules over C of X. So you do not take the quotient by x to the n. You work over, over c of x. And uh, so you go to the left by x to the k, you go to the right by x to the n minus k. This reminds you of the resolution, of the semi-infinite resolution on the conceptual side. So this is a matrix factorization because if you go both ways, you get x to the n, the simplest example. Now, how would you define morphisms? So you have, essentially you have two complexes, except that arrows shoot back and forth. And the square of the differential is not equal to zero. So question, can we, uh, can we develop a homotopy theory here? So can we explain what, what does it mean that two morphisms are the same up to homotopy? And the answer is yes. As long as W is a central object in the algebra, which it is because the algebra C of X is uh, commutative, you can repeat verbatim the proper story about uh, the proper story about uh, homotopy categories. Namely, you want to describe morphisms between two matrix factorizations. So take homomorphisms between these modules, any. They don't have to commute with the differential, just all the homomorphisms. This space will be Z2 graded again. And define a differential acting in the space of homomorphisms as a commutator with D. So here is the formula. Let me put it in red.
So, so you define a differential on homomorphisms between two modules. And the square of this differential is equal to zero, as it should be. Because by, su so you commute with D twice, and by super Jacobi identity, it's the same as commutator with D squared. But D squared is central, so you get zero. So you can either say that you got a DG category, so you have morphisms with differentials, or you can take homology and say that home between two matrix factorizations is homology of this differential uh, in all the homomorphisms. So in other words, you're taking homomorphisms which commute with twisted differentials up to a homotopy defined also by twisted differential. Uh, so when W is zero, you get the standard homotopy version, except that you reduced your grading from homological grading from Z to Z mod two. So in our toy model, now here are matrix factorizations associated with uh, uh, mod mod x to the k and mod x to the l. And so you may consider all the homomorphisms between these two complexes which commute with differentials. And now what will be the homotopy? You have the old one. So if you didn't have arrows shooting from right to left, you would have the green arrow, which kills x to the l, as it should. So that would be the old story. But you also have a new homotopy, which shoots from right to left, the red one. And this homotopy kills x to the n minus k. Remember, we had to kill it because it factors through a free module. So in this story, it, it, it's killed by this new homotopy. So this is, uh, how do you say? Uh, repulsive, revolting, but uh, nevertheless. The, so the, this, is, this is what a category of morphisms between two Lagrangian sub-varieties would look like. So another way to view this, and I think it's important, to view this category of matrix factorizations is that it is a deformation of the category of uh, sheaves. Uh, in what sense? Deformations are parameterized, uh, in, at least infinitesimally, by even elements of Hochschild cohomology of the category. And uh, such a deformation, now, usually people take second cohomology, which would be uh, because they want to maintain homological Z grading. So if you want to deform your category, use and, and maintain the homological grading, then use HH2, which consists of uh, two zero forms, which give you non-commutativity, symplectic structure, one one forms, which deform uh, complex structure, Beltrami differentials, and zero two forms, which turn sheaves into germs. So that's funny. So these are three deformations, three types of deformation of coherent sheaves. But if you're willing to sacrifice uh, Z grading, then you can take other even elements and still deform the category. So the simplest choice would be zero Hochschild cohomology, which would be just a function. So it's a polyvector field of uh, zero um, degrees, so to say, just a function. Uh, so how does this deformation work? Suppose, suppose that W acts, so suppose you have an a, a CX module M and W acts on it trivially. This tells you that M will survive the deformation. As usual, if, if you deform a category continuously, then not all the objects will survive. So M will survive. Uh, 
so consider a free resolution of M. Uh, w on that free resolution is uh, homotopic to zero. So there will be homotopy which kills W. So add this homotopy to the complex, to the differential, it will shoot backwards. But that's not the end of the story because uh, H squared might be non-zero. So this might require higher, uh, longer arrows shooting to the right to correct H. So H is, is not the only choice for homotopy. There may be other choices which even shoot longer. So you have to correct to make sure that ultimately d plus h tilde squared will be zero. So matrix factorization is a result of deforming coherent sheaves by W. Some sheaves survived and became matrix factorizations. In this story, uh, both differentials are somehow different. There was one which was inherited from the sheaf and the other one which which appeared because of the deformation. Um, so uh, let me just go over a few first properties of matrix factorization and maybe then just uh, Andre tell me uh, please when, when it would be uh, proper time to uh, finish. So what are the properties of, uh, of the category of matrix factorizations? So first of all, it is supported near the critical locus of W intersecting W equal to zero. So if, so first of all, if you are away from W equal to zero, then the square of your differential is non-zero so your objects will be contractible, presumably. So you should be in the formal neighborhood of W equal to zero for that reason. But you should also be close to the critical locus of W because assume your X is just C with uh, CN with the coordinates, W is D squared, take partial derivative with respect to one of the coordinates of both sides, product rule, so you see that partial derivative of W is a homotopy. It's homotopic to zero. It's a commutator. By the way, all commutators are considered super commutators. So you may get anti-commutator if uh, both have, are homologically odd. Um, so you take, so you see that partial derivative of W is homotopically trivial, which tells you that you should stay very close to critical locus of W, which is important. Uh, property number two. You can define a tensor product of two matrix factorizations. Their superpotentials will add up. So why do they add up? Because if you square a sum of two differentials, here. So you square a sum of two differentials. And then there is this formula that a plus b squared equals a squared plus b squared if a and b anti-commute. There is a, a mathematical joke about this. So this is indeed the case. D1 and D2 act on different modules in the tensor product, so and both are odd, so the anti-commute. So what you get is the sum of squares, W1 plus W2. So here it's written in, in, in short on the second line. And we need to tensor multiply matrix factorizations because we will have to explain how to compose morphisms between Lagrangian submanifolds. So the first, as, as, as I'll explain maybe next time, the fact that you live near a critical locus means that homes between two Lagrangian submanifolds are, uh, are supported in the vicinity of their intersection. And the fact that you can tensor multiply matrix factorizations and their superpotentials add up means that you have a well-defined 
composition of morphisms between Lagrangian submanifolds. And then there is a notion of a dual matrix factorization. Uh, the dual one would have opposite uh, superpotential. So you just uh, send arrows backwards and put an extra minus in one of them as defined here. So a dual of matrix factorization of W will be matrix factorization of negative W with dual arrows, with dual modules and dual arrows. So home from M1 to M2 will be canonically isomorphic to tensor product of M2 and dual M1. Now, as you see, the total superpotential on the right will be zero. So you can take homology as you would expect. So when you multiply matrix factorization of W by dual to another matrix factorization of W, what you get is an honest Z2 graded complex. D square will be equal to zero because potentials will cancel, which is good. Uh, so yeah, maybe I'll, uh, so th there will, there are especially important from technical standpoint, at least matrix factorizations, which are called causal matrix factorizations. So suppose your W is a product of two polynomials, then it's very easy to arrange for a matrix factorization. P will shoot one way, Q will shoot the other way. And if your W is a sum of products, then take the tensor product of the elementary ones, and that will be causal matrix factorization, which generalizes causal complex. So if you ignore Q, so, or set all Q is equal to zero, then it's the standard story about causal complexes. If polynomials P form a regular sequence, then the causal matrix factorization does not depend on the choice of Q. So it is determined just by polynomials P. And Q are, uh, you, you may have different choices of Q, but you will have isomorphic, uh, isomorphic matrix factorizations, not, not even homotopic, just isomorphic. So here is our main example. So why are we dwelling on this? Let me just tell you what our main example will look like. And uh, maybe then I, I could stop for today. So our X will be a product of three varieties, Borel upper triangular matrices, B, uh, nilpotent uh, radical strictly upper triangular matrices, N, and the matrix GLN. So GLN will parameterize a relative position of two flags. That's why it is in here. And uh, the whole construction will be equivariant with respect to product of two Borel subgroups, but let me ignore this for a moment. So this is our X and the superpotential will be, well, X times uh, conjugation of Y by G. Uh, the, the term conjugated Y represents a moment map coming from cotangent bundle of one of the flag varieties. So this is what we'll be dealing with uh, a bit later when we get to braids. Uh, Andre, would it be okay if I stop here? Uh, did I lose? Yeah, I must unmute my microphone first. Um, yeah, sure. We whenever, whenever it's a good, whenever you think is a good time to stop. We don't. We in the. I, I, I can uh, steam forward and say a little bit more about matrix factorizations, or I, I mean, uh, am, am I going in too many details? No, I think you're doing great, and uh, and we're uh, we're good as far as I mean, we we started a bit late, and so you have a uh, some time to if you want to finish something, please do. I think you're doing. I think I think well, I don't know. So I, if, 
Well, let me. I, I, yeah, I certainly very much enjoying what you you the presentation. So. Uh, okay, so I could go. So j just for. You know what? Maybe maybe I should stop here just because uh, it's a uh, it's a long presentation and it's a weird story about squares. So uh, or about differential squaring to something non-zero. So I, I can just show quickly what will happen next time. W what are the remaining properties of matrix factorizations that we will use for the construction? Um, so first of all, there is an important example of matrix factorizations where you have only two variables and you shoot back and forth by X and Y. So this category happens to be equivalent to just category of vector spaces, Z2 graded. It's a very simple category. If your potential is X, Y, okay, it has critical point, which is non-degenerate. So there is a general statement called Knorr periodicity, which says that if you have a variety and you add to it C2 and add X, Y to your superpotential, then you get an equivalent category. So adding two new variables and their product does not change the category. And then I will tell you about the Kazul duality, which, um, yeah, maybe, maybe it's good to put it off. Just one horror, just show you horror movie before, before I, I finish, a horror movie. So Kazul matrix factorization establishes equivalent, sorry, Kazul, sorry, Kazul duality says that modules over an even variable A are equivalent, derived equivalent to modules over an odd variable theta. So for that reason, both categories have the same Hochschild homology, which is polynomials over A and theta but with a different perspective of what the deformation means. So suppose you decided to deform them by common polynomial A to the N, an even element of the Hochschild cohomology. So if you deform modules over C of A, here in sheaves over C, you get matrix factorizations that we discussed, A to the N. But if you decide to deform it from the odd perspective, then you will get an A-type category because from the theta perspective, this A to the N is an N multiplication. It's a high, it's a high order deformation. It's homologically, it's, it's homologically of order two N and not because it's a polynomial in variable A whose homological degree is two, but because it's, it's, truly, it's truly deformation by homology of order two N. So you will get equivalent, a category which is equivalent to matrix factorizations, but the story will be, as I said, it's a horror movie. So matrix <laughs> factorizations are better. <laughs> of, course, of course, the right hand side corresponds to, algebra, uh, to derived algebraic geometry story. So we are better. Okay, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um. Actually, if, if we're in the question period, I had a very basic question. Suppose you have uh, two Lagrangians, mm -hmm. and of course you can uh, write them, you can choose many different coordinates in which they'll be given by a graph of a function, and, and then you're saying the corresponding matrix factorizations of the difference of these two functions are always the same, right? Is that, is that supposed to yes. be obvious? Is that supposed to yes. be... Uh, so something I will explain uh, maybe next time is that we have a Legendre trans... So example of what you're saying is would be Legendre or Fourier transform. I, you know, how about just linear tensor variables or something like that? Is, is that the, uh, so I mean, this is as, as, uh, as, as simple as... It, it's as simple as it, it, as it gets. Okay. So you have uh, C2 with coordinates X and Y. Mm -hmm. Now you have a function W of X, which describes something Y equals W prime. 
So now you wonder how to describe the same y equals w prime from the y perspective. So the answer is you have to take w tilde of x and y, which would be um, w of x minus xy, where, what, where x here is auxiliary parameter. So if you were really subjected to classical mechanics, hard way with the Hamilton Jacob mm -hmm. equation. Mm -hmm. But that, that stuff assumes that one of the Lagrangians is smooth, right? Uh, actually, it, actually, in this case, it, it might not be smooth from it. Well, it, the, like the X okay. Lagrangian, that is smooth in your picture. Okay, so let, let me answer this in two stages. Uh -huh. so first of all, if you use auxiliary coordinates, then you can define something which is non smooth. It's, so in this case, the projection might not be smooth. So for example, if, if you start with W of X being equal to zero, then what you describe is a uh, Y equals to zero from the Y point yeah. to okay, view. Okay. It's mm -hmm. a bad one. So your, so for, so, okay, to be very specific, your, um, your envelope in mm -hmm. case of, of Hilbert scheme, is non-smooth and we describe it in the following way. So we take T star of flags as auxiliary. Uh, so we multiply it by uh, Lie algebra, which is where X lives, mm -hmm. matrix X lives. And we define W that you've seen, which would be trace of mu times x. So by the standard formulas, the y matrix should be the partial derivative of w with respect to x. So this should be mu. So the, 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 so you may wonder why setting matrix y to be nilpotent gives you an important Lagrangian subvariety in Hilbert scheme. Why nilpotent? Why not just say that it's zero? And the answer is, at least from our perspective, is that there exists this auxiliary T star of B, which dictates that Y must be nilpotent because such is the moment. So you're, so in this- So go, going back to my question, I mean, if, if people if people are good with uh, generating function for Lagrangians and and Legendre transforms for them, they will should be able to see that that this matrix factorization of difference of two function is really independent of how you. It just depends on the two Lagrangians and and does not depend on how you present them as as a graph over the gradients of two functions. So if if I were to use um, Knorr periodicity, I could show you that. If you have two objects, w1 of x and uh -huh. w2 of x, sorry, w2 of x, then you apply Legendre transform and they become w1. Uh, now I will call it a, a1 minus a1y, because it's an auxiliary variable. I don't want mm -hmm. to x. And w2 of a2, it's a different one, minus a2y. So now what would be a home between these two from the y perspective? It would be matrix factorizations of the difference. So I would get y times a1 minus a2. So I'm subtracting second from the first, plus w2 of a2 minus uh, w1 of a1. Now I use the standard calculus trick. I, I replace, I add and subtract w2 of a1. So then I, and I use the, and I use the Bizu theorem. So now I have y 
um, sorry, now I have y plus w, if, I hope I don't screw up the signs, w2 of um, a2 minus w2 of a1 divided by a2 minus a1, which is a good polynomial. Oops, sorry. times a2 minus a1 plus now w2 of a1 minus w1 of a1. If you switch variables, call this one y tilde and uh, call this one a tilde, then you see Knorr term so Knorr tells you that you can ignore y or y tilde and a tilde, and you will be left with this. Which cool. is you know. Yeah, okay, that's super. That's much easier than I thought. It's playing with a certain chapter of Arnold in the algebraic geometry setup. It's, it's, it's really very uh, satisfying for me personally that Arnold's uh, book on uh, classical mechanics, a certain chapter can be uh, planted into algebraic geometry for matrix factorizations. More questions? Is there any comments? I'm like, maybe continue on your question. Mm -hmm. but I think they could, you know, the question was that, well, if you have a variety which is presented as a critical author of some function, <laughs> So uh, you can present it by critical loss of different functions, whether you whether you will get the same category of metric factorization. That was a question, more or less. So you know, it's like when you present something as a critical loss of some function, you get well, plenty of people say it's minus one symplectic structure. So uh, I guess your question was whether you know, if you have a minus one symplectic structure on a variety, could you present it? You know, could you? define some kind of graph category on this uh, minus one symplectic variety with some kind of local metric utilization, right? That's, that's the question. Oh, I'm but I think I think some people tried to prove something like this and they failed. It's kind of technically hard. But anyway. I, again, I don't know. Maybe maybe some people have more common. Maybe maybe less than you know? Oh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, Alexei, was that you? Yes, that was me. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite get your comment. I'm sorry. I mean, the question was, uh, how, like, well, suppose we have a two, um, we have the same variety, but it's presented by critical loss of two different functions. Ah. Can imagine what happened. Would the category be the same? Would be, would, you know, but you know, they could be the critical loss in kind of ambient, but two different ambient spaces. Yeah. Now we take, you know, category of metric on one and in another one. So you would want to have the somehow theorem that they're, that they're the same category. But I don't know whether that's true. Than... Sorry, I, I don't think that they would be the same, at least not the way you, you formulated it, because it's important how uh, W behaves in the vicinity. So for example, X squared and X cubed have the same critical locus, but categories of matrix factorizations are different. So well, but there, are, there are like examples of that when you're like on the level of the, just like a vanishing cycle, it doesn't really matter. You know, that it's kind of true, you know, if you have a, it's true if you study the virtual cycles and stuff like this, then it doesn't really matter how you present got the same. Results. Anyway, so it, that was more like a question. But again, may, maybe uh, Andre means something different. Maybe he can come. It certainly meant something different, but it's okay. I think we just, well, we just discussed my question. And so, uh, 
I think we should just thank Lev. If there are no further questions, uh, maybe we should thank Lev. And uh, and I, 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 did I understand correctly that uh, Arnold's book in classical mechanics is like required reading for the rest of the courses? Or at least everybody is strongly encouraged to refresh uh, your memories of uh, classical mechanics and generating functions for Lagrange and so forth. Um, and we will be looking forward to the next installment and uh, stay tuned for uh, the notes. All right. Thank you so much, Lev, and to be continued. Thank you very much. Thank you.